Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. Welcome back to my shop. You know, I got an email during the week that really hit home. It was from Derek Hale. So Derek, if you're watching, you inspired this one, so thank you for your message. And the message basically boiled down to the fact that, okay, I have my lathe in my shop. I got it all set up. Everything is good to go. It's plugged in. I went out and I tried to turn a piece on it, and it just did not give me what I was hoping for and why. Well, without actually standing there and looking over your shoulder, it's really hard to tell you why. But I'm going to give you a couple of things to think about. And this is day one kind of stuff, or week one kind of stuff. So let's make a couple of assumptions. Assumption being the machine is level, the machine is secure, uh, the work that you're trying to perform is within the boundaries of the safe operational capacity of your machine. You don't want to, you know, 15 inch chunk of steel and a six inch lathe kind of stuff. Make sure that the work that you're doing is suited for the size of the machine that you're trying to do it on. And day one, my machine shop, day one, take your rings off, take your watch off, roll your sleeves up. If you must wear a tie, tuck it in the top. I've seen engineers come running down from upstairs in some buildings and jump on a machine and ties all dangling. Well, that's good. You might as well just turn it around and hang yourself with it because you're right there anyway. Tuck it in. If you have long hair, got nothing against long hair, just tie it back. Because boy, when that gets wrapped around a chuck, it's going to pull you in and it's not pretty. I have seen it happen. Big chunks of your scalp getting pulled out and uh, you're just wandering around in a daze because you're in shock. Safety is number one with a lathe. They are incredibly powerful machines. Do not underestimate the power of the machine. Even though it's tiny, it will, it will show you who's boss in a heartbeat. Alright, anyway. These bullet points right here are the things that are going to cause a part finish and dimension to not cooperate. Derek's particular part was brass. He was trying to turn brass. He got chatter. If you got chatter, something to matter. You got to remember that. That's a real good thing to remember. Your machine doesn't speak until it chatters and then it's telling you something's wrong. Figure it out. Well, here's your checklist of things to figure out. Chances are, if you have something shaking around in your machine, it's a rigidity issue. Rigidity shows up as, as harmonic noise in your finish, or just an absolute horrific finish uh, that you probably couldn't replicate if you tried. So there are things to check if you have rigidity. Vibration chatter being the biggest indicator of something's going wrong. Taper and dimensional nonconformance would be the other things. It's too big out here and then it tapers down or it's too small and it tapers up. What's going on? Well, just because it's steel, high speed steel, large diameter brass, uh, stainless inserts, tool posts, things move. When they load up in a machining environment, they flex, they find their happy place and they stay there until the cut's done and then they rebound and okay, it's all good. It's like taking a nice clean cut on a piece of steel and you say, hey, that was nice. And then you crank it back and you leave a stripe going down your part. Well, it's because your tool loaded up as you took your cut. When it got to the end and there was no more cut, it relaxed. And when you bring it back, there you go. You just blew your part. So just something to think about. Tools move. End mills move. When you hit a piece of material with an end mill, as it's moving, it'll, it'll flex in the direction of the rotation. It'll actually flex as you cut across. You've cut your channel in your part, great. Come back through the channel. I bet it cuts on one side. Almost guaranteed. Anyway, let's get back to the lathe. If you have vibration and chatter, it may be the tool. The tool might be ground incorrectly, putting too much load on it. It's not getting the shear that it should. Uh, it may have too much grind and it's trying to aggressively dig in or run off on its own. It causes chatter as well. The setup of the tool. The tool could be extended too far out from the tool holder. There is no reason to have the tool hanging out too far from the tool holder if it's not at the bottom of a deep groove or something. If you're just turning the OD of a part of stock, then choke up on it. Keep it as close to the tool holder as you possibly can. If you have one of the old fire plug looking tombstone tool holders on your machine and you have the wedge under the tool, and you're using a small tool bit, and you crank that wedge to get that tool on center, well look what you've just done with the attack angles on your tool. Put spacers underneath that tool and just have a very mild top break. 
Try not to use that little orange peel wedge under the bottom to get it on center. Shim it up. Put another tool bit underneath it and shim it up. Lock it down. Speeds and feeds. Best way to describe speed and feed impact on the turn diameter is a thread. A thread is a controlled speed and feed control is a good word because that tool goes back in that exact same groove every time. Now just imagine you're cutting a 20 pitch thread. All is well. Take the tool over to the grinder and grind the nose of that tool off so that it's a hundred thou wide. Put it back in, engage the half nut right in the same spot. What happens? You just turn that diameter down because the tool is now wider than the feed. Makes sense, right? Speeds and feeds are critical. If the nose of your tool is too sharp and your feet is too fast, you're going to get a thread. Not a thread that's recognizable, but it's going to be a very rough exterior finish. And you're going to go, gee, how come? Well, because the carriage is moving 10 thou and you've got a 5 thou radius on your tool. Guess what? The part loses. Holder, tombstones, the old style, they can be pretty fussy. And uh, like I said before, Watch that little wedge on the bottom. It's better to space it up. Even put another tool on top of the tool that you're cutting with and crank it down and sandwich that tool in there. You don't want it flopping around. Quick change tool posts is what I have on my Loris lathe. Chances are you guys are very familiar with them by now. There's two types that I am aware of. One is a piston type. They both have like a dovetail uh, configuration on it. I think I've seen some that have a round edge as well. But the piston comes out and pushes the tool away from the block and locks it in. Well, you know, I mean, the cutting force is against that piston. I would rather have the cutting force against a solid mass than against a piston. And that's where a wedge type works very well because it pulls the tool holder into the block and there are no air gaps and everything is good because the only air gap is on the wedge side and that's on the downside of the force side. So it's a much better, in my opinion. Quick change tool pulls, wedge number one. I'm going to walk out to the lathe. I'm going to put a piece of one inch diameter brass or seven eighths somewhere thereabouts in a three jaw chuck. I'm going to turn it down. I am going to try to get a horrible finish on it. And then we're going to slowly back out of elements of the setup. And I'm going to make the finish look like a mirror. Well, just like the cannon barrel, for instance. If you didn't watch that cannon barrel video, take a look at that one. That was pretty good. That finish came out on that brass. Just beautiful. So I'm going to try to intentionally screw something up today and then correct it and hopefully identify the elements that caused the failure in the first place. Let's take a walk out to the machine. This is a giant oversized wooden tool bit. This demonstrates the three basic planes that you need to grind on your tool. The top can be flat, it can be sloped back, it can be mildly sloped forward but I don't usually do it that way. Looking at it from the side, top relief about five degrees. This is considerably more. This is maybe 10 or 15 degrees, but for sake of making the cut, I wanted you to be able to see it. The front is a little bit more realistic. Very mild. Doesn't have to be aggressive at all. This would be the nose radius of your tool. If you have a really nasty serrated type finish when you're done turning, increase the size of your nose radius and make sure that there's some back relief on it. So as it turns, it doesn't engage the OD that you're turning. Simple. Flat to five degrees back. Five degrees back, five to seven. Five on the front. And just a little nose relief. This is the edge that does all the work as far as the radius is concerned. Make sure that if you have any issues whatsoever, that's the corner that you address. Okay, simple. Just don't overdo it, okay? Mild is probably a whole lot better than aggressive. A lot of people overdo it, and the cutting edge over here is the first thing to go. Good luck. Okay, guys, the first variation here is just a recipe for disaster. We are a quarter inch uh, square tool bit, out about an inch and a quarter. Razor sharp tip on that tool, seven eighths diameter brass hanging out four and a half inches. Got about a 20 thou feed rate sitting on 1380 RPM. I suspect 
strongly suspect that when I engage the feed rate on this, this is going to give me an absolutely horrible, not even close to shiny finish. I don't think it's going to chatter because there is not much tool contact here, but I do believe we're going to get an absolutely horrific finish. So let me reposition the camera, fire up the spindle, we'll check it out. Now if my suspicions are correct, it's going to be pretty ugly. And for those of you that caught the fact that I called this an Aloris lathe before in the whiteboard, uh, sorry about that, this is a closing Colchester lathe, but it is an Aloris quick change tool post, so sorry about that. All right, let's check it out, see what happens. Get ready for some seriously ugly surface finish. This is a 22 thousandths deep cut, high speed steel, 20 thou feed rate. Alright, as expected. This is an absolutely horrific and it feels like a file, I love it. Uh, this is the result that you're going to see on your part. And man, those chips were hot coming off of there. That's spraying off there like fire. That was terrible. A finish like this you can expect when the tip of your tool, as shown on the board, is smaller than your feed rate. Okay? Very serrated, very nasty, just nothing tied together, basically exactly like a thread. Not enough surface finish to warrant chatter. Just a nasty finish. Changing over to, I'll bring it over, show it to you. I'm gonna change it over to this guy right here. Pull back on that, I'll show you. And this is one of the profile tools that I did the cannon barrel with. It's about a 20 degree both sides, about a 60 thou diameter on the tip. This will be the exact same feed rate, exact same RPM on that stock. And let's see what we look like. Because that finish is just brutal. We're going to go with a 25 thou depth of cut. Total diameter reduction, it's about 12 and a half per side. Alright, you can see immediately the difference is, is apparent. It's a lot cleaner because of the nose radius on the tool, the height of the resultant serrations are a lot lower, which makes it feel smoother. It certainly is not. If you could get real close to this, well, like, like this. You can hear it. That's what a nose radius will do for you. I'm going to keep it at the same RPM. I'm going to cut the feed rate down considerably and see if we can get this thing to uh, shine up real nice. Thou deep, same RPM, feed rates down to about eight. It's 
It's a much nicer finish. Still a little bit of noise in it. You can still feel it. You can still hear it. And it's very possibly because this tool is extended out as well and it's not supported on a center. So we might be picking up a little bit of chatter with this one. Let's move it closer to the collet. Do that again. Let's see if it's a rigidity problem. I was looking for a jewelry style cosmetic finish I wouldn't be thrilled with that like quite possibly the tip on the tool could need to be stumped I'm going to change it over to a TPG carbide tool triangular profile 5 degree positive 15 thou nose radius on this tool and let's see if it's the tool Five deep as well. Minor tearing in this material. This is a free machining 360 brass. I would say the only way to get a better finish than that is to slow the feed rate down a little bit more or possibly add lubricant. Here comes the air blast. All right, we're going to move this material way back out. Let's go back to the five inch number. Get it to chatter. I know it was four and a half before, but it's going to be five now because I want it to scream. And we're going to go for a considerable amount of surface contact here to get this to jump around. Thirteen hundred eighty RPM carbide. That is about a 150 radius on the tip of this tool. We're going to leave it at the slow feed. See if we can get it to jump around. That particular finish is absolutely indicative of something shaking around. And because this thing is five inches out of that collet, there is no question in my mind that this is the projection of the material. I firmly believe if we pop a center in the end, support this with a live center, this would not happen. Let's prove that theory real quick. Same depth of cut, same feed rate. The only difference will be the live center. There 
you go, night and day difference. Supported, unsupported. There is a huge difference in the shine on that material. I'm going to move this closer to the collet. I'm going to use the same tool, same depth of cut, same RPM, and I'm going to finish removing the chattered section closer to where you have the support just to show you that that tool combination should work if the material behaves itself. Okay, five inches out, supported with a live center, inch and a half out, no live center, and the very end, which I left just for comparison, five inches out, no support. Those little craters are chatter, caused by too much surface contact and not enough support. Let's put this thing in a chuck and see if we can get it to go even worse. Bear with me while I change it over. Three jaw chuck is now on the machine. The material is sticking out five inches. It is the exact same piece of material that was on there before. And the one thing I feel is rather important to mention because I'm just used to looking at it. In between these cuts, you may have noticed the run out of the material. I don't know if it was on the film or not. I have not actually watched it as I speak. But when you have a, a piece of material, especially, I mean, brass or stainless, and it's rather long projecting into the machine and you're only holding it on a very small section like a collet well inside the machine that material is sagging which would cause it to lift at the front and when you turn it on it's going to whip if you have something that you're trying to turn and keep straight and you want it to be relatively straight to the back of your material I would strongly recommend putting a collar on that material or figuring out some way to keep the back side of the material down inside the bore supported and concentric so if you didn't pick up on that play this video back and watch the eccentricity between these cuts this bar is not bent that bad but the collet fails to support excessive weight that's uh, inside the machine so we're going to start with the razor sharp tool we're going to start with the slow speed same 1380 and I suppose we're going to see the results going to be pretty terrible. Bad finish but not much chatter. Just a uh, serrated bad finish. High speed steel tool, quarter inch, sticking out an inch and a half. Material brass sticking out five inches, 1380 RPM. Feed rate is down around seven thousand. Twenty-five thousand depth to cut. This is going to be ugly. All right. Well, it deserves a close-up. If you're looking for a cosmetic grain finish, boy, you just achieved it with that one. Let me pop this off and get a little bit closer, see if you can get a good look at that. That is truly horrible. It's not nearly as sharp as I had thought it would be. But then again, the feed rate on this one, as you recall, was not as aggressive as the first time. First time was 20 thou. When the feed rate gets closer to the diameter of the round, uh, the nose radius of the tool, the finish will get better. And that's exactly what is apparent here. But I guarantee this material is going to scream like a big dog. 
momentarily when I put that big radius tool back in there because we have so much projection from the chuck out and it's only supported every 120 degrees so when the cutters are coming around although it's microscopic motion the harmony is interrupted and you're gonna see this is just absolutely gonna go nuts Deep. Here we go. Well, I gotta say, I am surprised at that. I am gonna feed in as I come across. I'm gonna feed deeper until I do get chatter, so bear with. That first one was 25 now, and as it slowed down, you could see the track line from the flex of the tool in the part. Do that again so it's a little clear. I'll go a little bit further and come back. Okay, you see the serrations in the beginning? That's from everything finding its happy place, flexes down, it's cutting nice. When you turn the feed off, it relaxes, and as you draw back, you get these serrations on the way out. A really good idea to pull the tool back and move it. Let's take a deeper cut and get it to scream. 50 thou. Sixty. to say that I am quite shocked by that. I would have bet this is going to jump all over the place. If that was steel, it would be jumping. I'm going to go for the throat here and take a really big bite, see what happens. There you go. Now that's a noise you don't want to hear. I'm going to snug up on the apron lock of just a hair to take some of the shake out of that. Still got a lot of noise. We have some faceting in the front of the material which makes it look like a diamond. I'm going to take some of the vibration potential out of this setup. By moving the tool back in the holder. This is the projection that I had mentioned in the setup. If you don't have to have the tool hanging out, don't. As long as the cutting edge of your tool clears everything downstream, you're good. See if it makes a difference. Okay, at this point I have to say that it is the three jaw support and the part is sticking out too far and the fact that it's relieved back here makes the front susceptible to more movement than the body. Let's move it into the chuck, leave the tool exactly where it is and see if we can get away with that cut. 
close up. Okay, you can see the fastening on the front from the vibration. It's actually not a bad finish if you were shooting for that, but the last thing you want to see that do is jump up over top of that tool and start making all kinds of problems for you. Now that we're right up against the chuck, if your chuck is worn and you over tighten it, it's going to have motion at the front and it is the tendency for it to wiggle back and forth or vibrate is going to be increased. If you've tried every conceivable trick in the book to eliminate chatter from your part right in this general area where the part engages the jaws wrap it once or twice around with scotch tape or masking tape whatever and then put it back in and squeeze on it if there's any flare to your jaws the masking tape may take up your air and your luck might get better now, I have not moved the tool I'm gonna to come in same RPM we're just closer to the chuck let's see what happens Well, the difference is obvious. There is no fastening in that cut with the tool choked up further in the holder and the material closer to the point of support. The results are, are just night and day difference. If you do not have to have your part hanging out, don't hang it out. If it does have to hang out, then support it with a center. Make sure that your feed and speed is comparable or in the same neighborhood as the nose radius on your tool. And everything should work out for you. Trial and error. All situations are different. All materials respond differently. That's all I got for you guys. I hope you got something out of that. There's uh, Okay, you can see the fastening is gone. That's absolutely got to be a result of the closer projection or the shorter projection from the chuck jaws out. The tool had been pulled back in the holder. And I guess the summary from this exercise is to make sure that your feet is slow if the radius is small. If the part is sticking out, support it with a live center. And if you don't have to stick it out for a long feature, then keep it as close to the point of support as you can. Any questions? Leave it in the comment line. Thanks, guys. On a side note, I was quite surprised when I had the 5-inch projection on this piece of material and we put the, the uh, radius tool on there and it didn't chatter as nearly as bad as I thought it was going to. I like to try to figure out why. And the best I can figure is that this length of engagement on these chuck jaws is about three times what you'll find inside of a standard 5C collet. The additional support of the jaws probably offset the gap in between the jaws and made up for it more ways than one. But I was shocked to see that and I just figured I had to share my logic on uh, exactly why that took place. I did not get the result I was expecting and that's got to be the reason why. Surprise, surprise. Alright guys, well I hope you got something out of that. I hope that I identified some of the gremlins that have been chasing you around in your shop and contributed something at least for you to think about. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind that there are probably a hundred other things I could have included in that, but I feel what I showed you was the very top of the items to uh, check off if something's going wrong with your, with your part and with your finish. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I know I did. I like working with brass. It always comes out pretty nice. But uh, make sure that you 
Think about this, watch the video again if you have to, trial and error, take it easy, watch your fingers. And until next time, thank you for stopping by. Joe Pisinski, Advanced Innovations, Austin, Texas. I'm out.